There's much more to life than drinking milk and paying taxes. Taxes, taxes, my dear. And to present you... That's mad. Jason Singer from Michigan. That's me. A singer from Michigan. A singer from Michigan in the band Michigan. It's a brilliant marketing move to be Jason Singer from Michigan. Living in Tennessee. Nashville, yeah. That was right. How did that happen? Uh, I met my wife in 2020. That'll do it. She lived here. And then I realized, oh, Nashville's pretty cool for musicians. Mm. Like it's pretty... It is like it was. I was like, oh, it's stupid that I haven't moved here before. I had uh, every, the resources and everybody doing it. If you sell something on Facebook, I found that selling things on Facebook Marketplace is an incredible way to network in this town. Really? Yeah. If you sell like, I had a desk, and uh, is like a standing desk, and I sold it. It was like fifteen hundred bucks. It was like a little higher ticket. Mm-hmm. And so the only person that you can be selling to in that instance is is like a higher ticket. Yeah, musician because they wanted uh, it was a production desk uh-huh. and so they wanted it and they showed up and they're like oh yeah I'm writing songs for this person this person and I was like oh nice to meet you that's so great cool. way of networking uh, this one time we sold some chairs on Marketplace and it was the art curator for the, like the Tennessee Art Museum really he was British I also almost got killed once by selling something on Facebook Marketplace so really? it can go yeah the guy like brought me to his RV he was like Come come over here and he's like opening up with it. I was like, I'm not coming over there. Yeah, that's weird. Um Okay. So the way this podcast works, I was explaining to you. I basically only prepare one question. So Love it. um everything else from there is gonna be free form. Um so here's my question for you. If you speak to any of our students at mastering.com, if you speak to any aspiring artists and you ask them what they want from their music, 99 percent Point nine percent of them are probably going to say something along the lines of like, I just want to be able to make music for a living. Right? Mm-hmm. I want to be able to tour. I want to be able to play some shows. I want to be able to open for some cool bands. Most people aren't going to say I want to play arenas and win Grammys because that's something that just kind of happens while you're busy doing the other stuff, right? Most people just want to make it a living. And sitting across from me now, like you've already done that. And yet when I listen to your music, and when I listen to interviews with you or when I speak with you, you sound very much like someone who views themselves at the beginning of their music career. Yeah. And I saw that you're in the process of recording your next album or your first album. Yeah. And I guess my question to you is like, have you had a moment to sit back and take in the fact that you have probably already achieved what the vast majority of artists want with their music career i think that as humans this is getting gonna get heady right away (laughs) i think as like humans we always there's like this internal like instinct that we always want more and we always want something more yeah and as soon as you like realize that i think you start to you start to kind of like be really grateful for what you have and where you're at uh, and like, be I'm like I'm stoked where I'm at. I'm stoked what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. I'm doing it on my terms, which is also super cool. Um, and how I want to do it for the most part, or and if I'm not doing it how I want to do it, I'm doing it how I should do it. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm being corrected by somebody on my team or something, it's like you should do it this way. I understand why. But the biggest thing for me is I. I feel like I'm just starting because like I was a band for like four, like three years before I put out a first song. You oh, know, that's cr- that like, flies in the face of every. That was also now. 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, which is crazy to say. They've been doing this for 10 years now and I feel like I'm just starting. Right. I think a cool thing about like when I was starting, it was like pre, it was like when social media wasn't very video driven. Yep. It was all about photo and everything. And so you didn't have to really post about everything you were doing constantly. And now I feel like in order to like do the game correctly, you have to be present online and you have to have like, um, you have to be like showing people what you are because you don't want people to forget about you because there's so many people out there. Um, I, that was yeah. the thing I kind of, I think the first time I ever found you, I was scrolling through TikTok. And I saw you, and it was just your face, and you were like, hey, I'm Michigander or whatever. And and I remember you were, like, going through old clips of, like, music that you had played forever ago. 
and it seemed like it was your first kind of step into like trying to, to do social media more. Yeah. And then I remember looking you up and listening to you and you sounded like a really seasoned, like, I get the impression that you're someone that you want to see a lot. That was like your stomping ground for like the oh, yeah. majority of your totally. life. And then social media comes in and it's like, now you have to do that also. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you want to see Michigander, I feel like you want to see you live. Yeah, I think the live show is like the best part of the job. Yeah. For a lot of reasons. It's like A, the way to make the most money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that and like one of the only ways to make money. So yeah. it's like right now I'm like not touring mm. per minute. And it's like, uh that sucks. Cause yeah. I and it's like I have to, to take a break. I have to like not tour for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad I'm not touring right now. But it's also like I wish I was making money. Yeah. Wish I had a way to make some dough. That has to be a hard balance, I can imagine. If you if you are a band that makes your money touring, you've sentenced yourself to like Yeah. You have to do it that way. You every time you relax, there's the opportunity cost of I could be out playing shows. Exactly. And so even when you're relaxing, it still feels like you're like yeah. taking time away right. from making money, which has gotta be hard. That is frustrating. Mm. Uh the other reason why like the shows are like the best part of the job is like you are literally in a room with people who are there to see you yeah. and are like connected in some way, different levels to your songs and like in somewhat ways as you as a person. Yeah. And to feed off that energy is crazy. I think that's why I was drawn to your music when I started listening to it because I got the impression that we had grown up on the same types of music. Probably. You know, sometimes. Probably. 28 cool i'm 30 yeah. something 31 i got the feeling because i remember hearing you and i remember this era of like late 2000s early 2010s right before social media like was the main thing for artists where you kind of had this emergence of really great like festival bands mm -hmm. and great live shows um and it kind of just, whenever I listen to you, I get the vibe that you're like, it feels like you're walking into a festival and you hear and, someone yeah. playing on a on a stage uh -huh. a while ago <laughs> yeah. and you've like had a couple white claws and you're starting to feel like a little a little good. And then, and then you hear like a song like, like Super Glue or something. And you're like, oh, this is right where this band yeah. should be. That's the like the exact um, thing I keep in mind when I'm writing like 90% of my songs. Okay. And that is the exact thing that comes across when you listen to it. And that's so awesome. my question is like, where, why, why did you optimize for that thing? I think that's what I grew up on. I grew up on like watching videos of like Glastonbury and Bonnaroo and all these like <sighs> Lollapalooza videos from like early 2000 being like, oh, that's what I want to do. Oh, I didn't really realize like all the other stuff, but like the writing of the songs and everything. It's like, I just want to do that thing. I just it's want to be on the festival stage. It's so funny that you say that because it's funny now that I'm doing this podcast because, like, I grew up, the way I got into music was watching music interviews. I used to watch music mm -hmm. interviews all the time. Yeah. But there was one live performance. I would watch interviews and live performances. There was one live performance that made me want to be a musician was made the thing that made me. It was, it was Coldplay at Glastonbury singing Fix You. Yeah, seen it a million times. I've watched that a million times. And if you watch that video, if you type in Coldplay Fix You Glastonbury, that will make you go, I don't want to ever do anything but oh, music. Oh, yeah. That's literally the band that I like saw like on television or something, like some t live stream or something when I was younger, and I was just like, holy moly. I remember I was listening to your album last night, I think, or something. I was like, Milo Xylitoe, you remember that Coldplay yeah, album? Yeah, yeah. I was like you can hear that influence oh, cool. in a Thanks, lot of man. your songs. Thank and you. that was one of my favorite albums. And oh, yeah, like, so good. And you see that video and you go, that I would never want to do anything other. So when I go to your Spotify page or whatever and I see the picture of you in front of, yeah. what was that, that Lollapalooza? That's Lollapalooza, yeah. What was that like? Well, that's the, the cool story about that um, is like in 2016, I think I put out my first single. It's called 90s. And... Um, it did okay, you know, for independent artists. Um, and it was super interesting to put that out because I didn't really know what to expect. It was like Spotify and every day I'd be like refreshing and trying to see like the streams. I, yeah. They didn't have analytics really for just anybody back then. But I was like, oh, I should play a lot of blues now. I'm a Midwest band. I should be playing. <laughs> yeah. I could open up one of the stages. So I got a hold of somebody to try to play a lot of blues in 2016. 
I emailed them. Guy emailed me back. He's like, how'd you get my email? Yeah. This song's actually pretty cool. Uh, and we, he's like, can you hop on a call? And so I talked to this guy, this manager guy um, named Simon. And, uh, and we just kept in touch over the years. Fast forward to 2019, uh, that same guy works with his management company that now manages me. Uh, and they had a label and they signed me and they did all that stuff. And so then to 2021, I ended up playing the festival. So it was like all because of a stupid little email. Dude. I sent in like 2016. I ended up playing this festival in front of like, I don't know, like 10,000 people. It's a cool picture. It's the coolest photo. It's like, I think that's the one I'll show the kids. That's your cool play picture. That's that's, like that. That's like the, you're reaching out to the crowd. They're reaching out back. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the best feeling in the world. And then like you walk off stage and you're just like, oh yeah, it's just me. Just what I did. Yeah. Like my wife is here. My friends are here. My managers are here. And we're like, we just did that. That's cool. Let's do that again sometime. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then you like run to the bathroom or something. You run like to the bathroom. You like... meet Mark Rebele on the way to the bathroom. You're like, oh, hey, I just played. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Warmed him up for yeah. you. That's like, yeah, that's kind of true. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so fun. I want to underline that point because like we work with like a bunch of artists at mastering.com. And I, I, coming from the business world, the power of an email mm-hmm. is so, is, I, I, can't tell you how easy it is to just reach out to people and if you're okay with them telling you no then it is so easy to have doors open up for you if you just ask and 99 percent of people rule themselves out before they even bother to ask like you probably could have very easily been there and been like who who am i to be emailing a Lollapalooza? i'm not gonna do this he's gonna say no and i'm gonna what but even if it didn't lead to something right then it led to something five years down the road right yeah it's good to be delusional in a way. We said this in the last podcast. You have to just believe. Healthy delusion. Yeah, you have to just believe that you deserve it. I approached you at a Fleet Foxes concert yeah. back when I was trying to make it as a musician. I was like, hey, Jason, like, well, it was nice to, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Couple year year down the road. Yeah. Different setting. We're doing yeah. podcasts instead of music. And it's like. Having a great conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Like, it is crazy how much it, how easy some things can be set in motion, even if it is five. You just got to be patient, wait for those things to play out. It is all about patience. It is about waiting. And it's also just being, you know, just, I think the email to a manager makes a lot more impact a lot of times than just a DM to an artist. Yeah. Yo, listen to my new track. It's like, the weird thing is, is when I first started, I would listen to everything that came into my inbox. If anybody was like, hey, I love your music. Here's my music. And I made a lot of friends that way. But now it's like you get those DMs and you're just like, that's great, man. I And I feel bad in a yeah. way that I can't listen to everything that people will send me. And it's just so strange. It's like a strange, and I just feel, I just feel bad about it. Well, what we try and tell as students is like, you need to have something of value to offer somebody if you want them to help you back. And it's like, yeah, some people think that's a skeptical take. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, because like you don't want to always have to like give something yeah. to get something. But then you're just relying on that person being altruistic, which maybe they are. But but if your inbox is flooded with a million different people, who's to say that like they're going to have the ability to do that? So like it's much easier to get someone to listen to your song if you've somehow figured out a way to add value mm-hmm. to their life yeah. first. Right. Um, and that's can be difficult to find like what that edge, edge is for you. So I want to go back to Lollapalooza though. Like, yeah. So you step out onto that stage mm-hmm. after X amount of years and there's what you said, 10,000 people. There. Started out with like a few, I, well, I didn't want to look. I was like, I don't want to look out there until I walk out. So I'll just like, you let me know when we're good. And I'll walk from the trailer to the stage. So I was like, okay. I was like, Oh, I was expecting 500 people, you know, that okay. Be- put me in the trail, put, put us in the trailer first. What are you yeah. doing in there? A vocal warm up. Yeah. You do the vocal warm ups. <laughs> There's not like a lot of emotional stuff that happens pre show. I wish there was. There's nothing like sacred really. Yeah. Before the show. The before the show thing is just warming up my vocals, making sure someone tuned my guitar, mm-hmm. making sure it all works, and then making sure everybody's good to go and knows what we're going to do. And then usually the emotional stuff happens. During a song called East Chicago. That's mm. always the moment. 
for some reason there's like we have a moment to just take a breath and whether taking the situation whether it's like horrible and you're in Eureka Springs Arkansas playing to <laughs> nobody or you're at Lollapalooza playing for 10,000 people or you're in Detroit selling out the show the venue that you saw your favorite bands at when you're a kid it's like that moment in that little time where you of that song before it starts, we just like it just it's just a chill moment and we're just the band is vamping and I always take a minute to look out and see what's going on. And it's mm -hmm. like take this in because A, you you know this should this should have happened. And it might not ever happen again. So it's just like being up there and being like, Oh, this is crazy. Do you remember it clearly or is it Uh like, yeah, definitely. Do you remember anybody's face? No, I just remember just being like this is nuts. And I like, turn around to Aaron, be like, how, this is crazy. Yeah. Like I, like I just vividly remember it. It's cool that we have some like pretty good video from that day too. Yeah. But it's just, there are shows where it's just, it's just wild to see, it's just wild to see that many people. And they're not all there to like sing every word to my songs, but they're yeah, there. But they're there. To see what's, what's going on. And that's pretty, pretty, pretty wild. So, Okay, I want to go back a little bit before we catch back yeah. up to that point. Um, you said you played for how long before you released the song? Uh, well, I started making music in 2011. Okay, and how did that start? Uh, out of necessity because I didn't want to go to college. I loved making music. I loved playing music with my friends. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, um, eventually I just needed an outlet to play and ha try to have a job. So I played cover sets at bars. For like in the on the weekends for a couple hundred bucks every weekend, so living with my folks, and I was just doing that. And eventually, I moved to a place called Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is like the west side. Western Michigan University is there, and I like met some people and like just had friends there, and we started playing together. And these guys were just like playing with my songs for me, like in these shows, and we were playing at bells or like shorts or founders or whatever uh playing shows it was awesome it's cool just to play and like be like oh these are my songs and this is like a band i have so you were of. writing originals at that point yeah i was writing originals like right out of high school in high school senior year 2011 oh, okay uh that i thought were like decent and we were playing them out which was pretty cool and that must have probably been like a pretty crazy feeling in its own right was like yeah because it was like oh like that's that's over 10 years ago now yeah that's a long time ago yeah that's not like a few, like 2018, you know, like I, it's just been like forever. And like some of those songs we still play, which right. is weird. I remember seeing, I think it was in like your TikTok that I found you on, or I think the song was High Hopes or Let Down, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing you in that. It was like a house or something, someone's house, and you were playing yeah. that song. Oh, Fears, I think it was. Maybe. Well, anyway, yeah, but yeah, it was something crazy like that. Yeah. Like, oh, no, I was playing a song called Fears in Chicago. I wrote in high school, and then we were playing at a house show for like eight people, eleven yes. people, and then you fast forwarded, and to then like, we were opening for the Lumineers in front of like five thousand people in Chicago, playing that same song. It's oh. crazy. It's nuts. It's nuts. What did that feel like? Because I, the Lumin, if if I had my big board, like obviously original yeah. fan club member, uh -huh. uh, Lumineers are in the in, on that big board, so. I remember seeing you get, because I think I was following you at that point uh -huh. in time, and I remember seeing you get like the the gig of opening up for them, and I was like, "Dang it!" Because I was crazy. like, I was trying to, I, I was trying to make it as a musician. Every time you see people doing that, you're like, "How can I do that?" And yeah. uh, I had been playing it all, so uh, it makes sense that I did. <laughs> uh, but what was that like? Um, realistically, super, like realistically, it was like, "Hey, could you open for Lumineers?" Okay, what are you doing on this day? Yeah. I said, why? Like, radio show opening for Lumineers. It's like, oh, that's crazy. You'd think they would lead with that before they say, what are you doing? Well, thing? my radio guy, Joe, Joe, if you're watching, <laughs> he likes to tease me. Yeah. And he goes, what are you doing on this day? And I go, I don't know. And he's like, well, what if I told you this? Oh, sick. That and is a I'm cool like, move. Okay, Joe, thank you. Uh, so, Joe sounds like a cool guy. Yeah, Joe's a cool guy. He's a wild man. Uh, shout out Joe Greenwald. There you go. Um, but Joe told me, he was like, yeah, you're going to open. If you can do it, we'll open. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. So, and they're like a band. 
like I loved growing up. Yeah. Like I saw the first tour and when they came to Michigan for the first time, one of the early shows. Um, and it was so cool. I mean, it was amazing to play with them. Like that was another crazy day. Like just to look out and see that many people in like a inside, not outside, yeah. like inside a venue that I love. Uh, yeah, it was so cool. Did you get to meet them? Uh, no. Dang. Yeah, I know. That blows my mind that you open for bands and then you don't get to like, I always picture you're like chilling in the no. back. Y'all are drinking. It's crazy. Like kicking it. Like you've got they're a big be, band. Yeah, they're, they're huge. a huge band. I they're think, sneaky huge too. That's the thing is like when I, when they first popped oh yeah. off, I used to think of them as like my, like, you know, I'm a little indie. I was yeah, like, yeah. these are my indie band. No, huge they're band. freaking huge. They're, and they're bigger now than they've ever been. And then they've, yeah. Which is crazy. Wesley did DM me. He said, really that great show or something. That was very nice. That is cool. But uh, I did not get to meet them, though. I've DM'd him. <laughs> it's like, th see, this is like when you uh, when you pick up a rock and you see, like, all the bugs underneath. Uh -huh. It's like the dark underbelly of the music world uh -huh. where it's like, there was a period of my life where when I was first trying to make him music and I was just sort of like, you're, like, sending your tracks and, like, you're reaching out to people that you have, like, no business. Uh -huh. uh, like, again, exactly like you said, because you don't know what the, th what the one connection is that's going to be, and he was gracious enough. He messaged me back. You know, oh, that's wished, so nice. He wished me luck with my my single release. That's so awesome. Stuff. Dude, that's so, he, yeah, I heard he's a great guy. I don't really know. I thought you guys got to kick it no. backstage. Can I open this Please without do. breaking the? Yeah. First, uh, they just agreed this is, to. Uh, this is our, the sponsor, right? Sponsor the pod today. Well, they sent me some in the mail. Dude. I talked to the guy this morning. I can get you hooked up. All right, up. here we go. That's honestly really good. See? That's what I said. I only, I've only I only had one, and then I immediately called the guy, and I was like, "Can you do this for the podcast?" And this is from Nashville. Yeah, they're from Nashville. Okay, that's crazy. It's really good because you were spindrift guy. I'm a spindrift guy. You're spindrift through guy. So I called him up. Three and I was seven like, two one zero and three seven two eleven. That's the area code. And three seven two zero nine. May pop. There you go. Now they can clip that. May pop. Send me some in the mail. S Spindrift. That works, right? Yeah, dude. Spindrift. spindrift, I love you still. But this is my mistress. Um, okay. I want to kind of like flip now and talk about like you you we talked about like those moments that are the surreal moments. But now I kind of want to like zoom in on what it's actually like to be a working musician. Love it. And I want to say like you're you play for the Lumineers, everyone's going nuts. And then there has to be a moment when you're like driving home. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, like mm -hmm. what you drive, but it's like, you know, you're driving home your car, just yeah, stuck in traffic. Like, maybe you're like, your stomach hurts because you got like some gas stu station sushi <laughs> or something. And it's like the reality of, oh, I'm still me must kind of set in and be like, um, trying to juggle this crazy high that you probably had with kind of assimilating into a very normal life of a normal person. Oh, yeah. What is that like on a day-to-day -day basis? I have such a weird life in the way that I don't have, like, some crazy social media following where it's, like, um, my feed's just blowing up all the time. I don't have that. Uh, what I do have is, like, good shows. Mm -hmm. We do good. Like, shows are awesome. Um, and so the only time I really feel cool or like on top of it ever is when I'm on stage. Like I, and even then sometimes I'm like, this is what? like we're yeah. not doing good tonight. You guys are into this. I feel like I've got people tricked sometimes, but I do have those moments where I feel real, um, from the emotional side of things, I'll start there. Like that is such a weird thing because I remember so many times I'd play like these big shows and then I would just drive home alone. I would never go out after a show, like in Michigan, say. I would never be like, okay, let's go out to this thing now. But like, no way, I got a van full of gear. I yeah. can't just go hang out somewhere. I don't want my van to get robbed. So that really does dictate a lot of my after show activities. <laughs> not um, wanting to get robbed. Not wanting to get robbed. It really does. Yeah, like, I believe uh, it. Um, and then like the other side of thing is like the ebbs and flows of like money is crazy like you can go on one tour and you can be gone for five weeks and you'll walk away with like a few grand which is awesome 
because like your expenses are all like kind of covered on tour. Yeah. But like you come home with a few grand, and you're like, oh, cool. Now I don't have to work for a month or two. And then you'll be like, okay, here's a publishing deal. It's like, okay, cool. That is like X amount of money. That's someone, that's like a normal human being's salary yeah. for a whole year. And you're not going to see another one of those. And for two years, and then that gets like commissioned, which it should be commissioned because you have all these people working for you to get you this stuff in the first place. So like, like the goal for like a tour is like for the artist to walk away with 30% of like the whole thing. So say like the tour makes $100,000. After all expenses, commissions, overhead personnel, staff, the artist, the band should walk away with thir like $30,000. So that's that's cool. But then it's like, okay, now I'm not working for a long time. Yeah, it's cool until you realize how like you got to live on that money. But all, yeah, but also that money comes in and you can't just be like, oh, that's just my rent money for a year. It's like, no, like that money has to be like, hey, we need $1,000 for you to get this new keyboard for the shows that you have right. to play later. And then it's like, uh, what about running ads for this show? And it's like, okay, yes. What about buying new merch? And it's like, okay. So then you're like down to $20,000. Right. So that's how it goes. And it's, it's really hard to... Uh, mentally deal with that sometimes it's it's really cool in the moment when you're like I'm making money I'm doing it I'm paying my guys what I think is pretty good uh, especially because we haven't been able to pay people that good for so long and now it's like oh we can bonus people I can buy like like this last tour we got to buy everybody like a Nintendo Switch yeah like which is like oh that is crazy imagine like, when we first started like the first band I took out was like a 11 day tour and I was like I can pay you guys each 200 bucks a whole tour and my friends were like yeah let's do it but now it's like they gotta take care of these people yeah like, in a way they're, they're, but it is it is really and I'm not like upset about paying people and taking care of people like I need I love that I get to do that it feels so cool to pay like a $10,000 commission bill well that was the that was the thing with mastering.com when when we start when we were scaling up mastering.com was I never realized how heavy it weighs on you to be paying people for people's livelihood to come from mm -hmm. something that you're in, in charge of running. Mm -hmm. um, like we'll go on our team meetings and we have about 20 people now in the company and, and I, I, you admit people into the room and you've got 20 people staring at you and you go like, that person just had a baby. That just person just moved across the country. And it's all because of what we're doing here. And that's an amazing feeling. But in the same sense, it's also a lot of pressure to go like, yeah, there's something here that needs to continue to be fed because if it doesn't, all of these people's livelihoods are on the line. And uh -huh. you're at the helm of that. Yeah. Getting to the point where it's like I have a wife. And I have like, we want to buy a house and we want to have a kid. That's before you even factor in all the things you want to do. That right? Yeah. Like you have to worry about that. And that's before you ever even consider right. how do I survive? Totally. It's like getting, you have to, like I've learned in the last like five years, they have to spend a lot of money to make any money. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of money. And then once you start making some money, you're like, okay, how do we scale it up? to spend more money yeah and you have to like pull the reins back even more just how it goes over and over and over again are you signed to the label uh when will this come out uh a week two weeks i'm signing to a label oh dang yeah really is that like is that mad records exclusive uh yeah i guess i, I can't am, say oh, who it is yet yeah, all right cool yeah no yeah. worries all right well we got the exclusive um because this is the thing with independent artists is you get your, let's say you go out on that tour and you bring in 30 grand. Mm -hmm. um, Seems like a lot of money. It does. 30 grand sounds like a lot of and money. And it evaporates like that. And the thing that I've noticed out in the artist world is that there are very few people that are teaching artists how to manage their money properly and how to run their artistry as a business um because a lot of artists will take that 30 grand and they'll like 
make a sick music video with. They will make like yeah. an absolutely baller uh-huh. music video and it will make them zero dollars. Uh-huh. And but they'll have this baller video, it'll fit their vision. They'll be like, it's my my masterpiece. And then it's like, okay, but now we don't have any money to make any money. Yeah. Um, so obviously if you've been doing this for like 10 years, you've clearly been successful at continuing to feed this thing. What was that process like? Um, well, at first, I think like the number one thing that I have learned. And it's not, like, so much of a thing now, but, like, even, like, three years ago, it's, like, not being above having, like, um, a normal job, like, right. to supplement your income as an, a creative or an artist. Like, it is totally okay to work a few months at a coffee shop, especially if you're, like, a touring musician or you're, like, a gun for hire, and you're, like, I'm home now, what do I do? It's, like, just go work at a coffee shop. Yeah. Just go work. Like, it's totally cool. Like, in Nashville, you can make a lot of money working at a coffee shop. That's pretty crazy. Like, I mean, the cost of living is higher. Yeah. But, like, I have friends who make, like, 30 bucks an hour working at coffee shops. And everyone around them is a musician. That they and everyone's have. a musician. And it's, like, the huge thing to tell people is, like, don't, it, like, it sucks to work a day job. There's no question about it. And there's times where I've, like, had money, and then, like, a couple months later, it's like, I don't have any money. I'm going to work at this coffee shop. Yeah. And uh, it, it definitely is humbling, um, and it's frustrating sometimes. But um, I think it's totally fine. I just there's like a stigma around it, especially in Nashville. It's yeah. like if you t- some people wanted to say like, like in Nashville, I feel like so many people are afraid to tell you that they work, they Uber drive, yeah, or they <laughs> or they work at a bakery or a coffee shop or serve at a restaurant. There's like nothing wrong with that, especially if you're like really, if you're really putting the time in for the the dream and the only way to make the dream happen is to pull espresso shots. That's so sick. And like, you should not be ashamed of that. You should not be ashamed of that at all. There's, it's like such a stigma. It really is a stigma here. It's not, it's not bad to work at a coffee shop. But it's it's great. It's like it's not bad. I think this is going to be a common theme with this podcast because I had a conversation with the last guest who was on about this as well. The musician that works at a coffee shop and takes that money and puts it into ads for their music or something like mm-hmm. that, that is the savvy musician. That is the yeah, musician that will time. make it. Because here's the thing, like, yeah, maybe you got to work at a coffee coffee shop and maybe you tell someone that and they scoff at you or maybe they b- b- pretend like they're big time or whatever. It doesn't matter. If you keep doing your thing and you keep making money and you keep investing that money wisely into your music, uh-huh. one day you won't be at that coffee shop. Yeah. And you'll see that same person who scoffed at you and you will be in a completely different position at that yeah. point because you did – the business smart thing of mm. reinvesting into your business. And to do that, you need money. And if the right. money's not coming in from day one, which it won't, right. you got to go make it happen. Yeah. It's a wild, it's a wild business. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, cause I was picking up on this when I was listening to your albums and I didn't know if it was correct or not. So I wanted to ask you personally, let's go. I get the vibe that a lot of your songs are written about like your career about your music and like this idea of like give oh should i keep doing this should i not Uh and i couldn't tell if you were talking about a girl because i was like this guy's married i couldn't tell if you were talking about your career but it seems like a lot of those songs kind of are a little bit of both yeah is that true or am i way that's big true yeah no one's ever you don't have to say to me no no one's ever said that before that's what it's about most most things are about like my biggest muse is my my career. That's okay. That's why, yeah. cause you were like, cause in the was it super glue or whatever? Am I wasting my emotion on you, baby? That chorus is about someone. Okay, but the overarching. I'll edit that like, out. That no, that <laughs> chorus is about someone, like okay. a real person. Uh, that has nothing to do. With, that chorus has nothing to do with the music in business, and some of it, you know, some of it. It do, like I have this weird relationship with music, I guess. 
in my career. She's your mistress. Yeah, music is my mistress. But that song is about someone, mostly. And then it, then it shifts to not being about... It takes a it, different Then form. it definitely is about my, like... There's like a lyric about me living in Russell Woods, which is the neighborhood I lived in Detroit, and it was like such a waste of time for me to live. Shocking news story. But I lived there for like nine months in Detroit, and I was like, eh, this isn't it. Then I came here. Um, but... Yeah, I do write a lot of music about um, hypotheticals. Um, and I've really never, like, besides working in a coffee shop, like, I've never had, like, a real honest job. And, like, it's always been, like, weird things. You just kind of make the, make the thing, not music jobs, just, like, delivering papers and working with special needs kids and, like, doing all these random things to, like, make the dream happen. But, yeah, that is true. A lot of my music is about... Uh, the job, which I think is a which no one has ever said before. I can't, let, I can't let that get out. This isn't recorded, right? I'm listening. Um, I feel like that's super valuable. I think I was watching an interview. It was like Joni Mitchell or something, and she was saying, "How can I ever run out?" I I could be wrong about this. It might not be right. No, it's good. I uh, can tell. She was like, "How can I ever run out of lyrics if I just always talk about what I'm doing?" She's like, when I sit down at the piano or whatever, I just write about what's on my mind and how can you ever run out of anything? And so if music is the thing that you know, it makes sense that you could write songs about mm. about your music career. And it's funny that those are the songs, that these songs where you're kind of like playing with the idea of like either giving up or like chasing yeah. the dream end up being the things that actually get you to the point where you're playing Lollapalooza. Yeah, it's like kind enough. of a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Just watched that. Uh, I rewatched the uh, Bruce Springsteen Broadway. Mm, um, I never saw it. So good. Highly recommend it. But he talks about like he never worked in the factory. Mm. And he never did all this stuff. He was never. A, he never had a job. Yeah, because like, he's like blue collar. Like yeah, he has Bruce all these songs about like driving yeah. to Nebraska and like, like the common man, in, like the factory and the down at the farm and like all this stuff. He never did any of that. Mm. Uh, which is crazy because you would think he did. Yeah. But he just kind of like created this whole world and this image of himself that isn't like realistically true, but it is true to him. So yeah. who is that person for Michigander? Who is what? What do you mean? What, what is the, if Bruce Springsteen's Mr. Blue Collar, like working man from New Jersey, who's, who's Michigander? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I feel, truly, I feel like the DIY local band who's, like, doing it. That's all I am. I was just a kid playing every coffee shop, every bar, any DIY venue, playing for whatever mm -hmm. for years to now playing clubs and hopefully one day theaters, hopefully one day... Bigger theaters. Arenas. <laughs> or arenas. arenas. Yeah, sure. Stadiums. Yeah. No, but like I am just like the a Eras tour. Yeah, I'll have my Michigander, own Michigander Michigan Eras. Eras. Tour. Yeah. I feel like what I've done is just like I'm just a local band building a following the same way I thought about it when I was younger. And that was just like, how do I build some markets with two hundred worth two hundred tickets in every market? Cool. How do I now I have ten of those? How do I do twenty of those? Right. I always just think in terms of like I want to, like if I never had to record any more music, how would I tour? How would I do this? Um, luckily, I have the like the resources to do music and record music and have a van that we could tour in. But like, yeah, that's always what I think about. I just I like, just feel like a local band, mm. and it's honestly probably annoying sometimes to my management because I will just go do things and try to get things done. Mm. And they're like, yo, include us in these, please. <laughs> like, do this. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I got to do be better about that, definitely. Because they are way smarter than me when it comes to all that stuff. Uh, and <laughs> you're like a doer. Yeah, I just be like, oh, God, I need a photographer. I'll just text somebody. Yeah. I need this. I'll just text this person. I won't have, like, yeah. my team handle it, which is would be smarter if they handled it most of the time. Right. Yeah. But in your head, you're just the... You're I'm just, just the like, guy. Like, I need someone... I, like, if I need something done tomorrow, I'll text somebody, like, when I leave here. Okay. Let me ask you this, then. If you're that guy and, and you're the DIY guy, um, 
if you had an artist now who doesn't want to go to college and decides like I want to start a band uh -huh. with my boys I want to get my boys or my girls together uh -huh. and start a band would you recommend them going the same route that you did yeah only thing I would change different and it was like such a thing I had such a bad attitude about coming from like a small I grew up in a place called Midland Michigan I don't know how many people live there maybe 30,000 tops Nicest restaurant was an Applebee's. Dude. Like, you know. I grew that, up in Scranton, PA. Yeah. So okay, there's yeah. like very similar. Just a small stuff. town, you know. Uh I my biggest it's my biggest hold up when I was younger, and I think if it had some kind of thing to do with like all my friends moving away to college and stuff. Um, my biggest hold up was going leaving. It was like I need to leave here. I need to leave here. And in hindsight, the story makes sense, and like the story is important that I did stay in Michigan for as long as I did and where I did. Like I probably wouldn't have the same path that I had if I didn't do that. But like I wish I would have moved to Nashville sooner. Okay, I wanted to ask you about that because I I always growing up in Scranton, PA, there is like if you grow up in a small town, you always have this concept of like I got to get out. Uh huh. It's very weird. Like you you're. You're born there and like immediately from the beginning, you're like, if I'm going to make it, if I'm going to make my parents proud or whatever, mm -hmm. I got to get out. Um, and then you get out and it's like a little bit weird because those are your people. Yeah. Like those are your people. And there are, there's no one that um, like everybody comes to Nashville and they're kind of like these transients that come through and like, you know, some people are from here and some people aren't, but your people probably are very much like, in Michigan yeah but not anymore right like that's the thing is like which is crazy because you're called Michigan yeah it's like <laughs> so I it's love like, Michigan and I will definitely live there again when I'm older 100% yeah. okay I will live in Grand Rapids Michigan when I'm older that sounds like a great place it's to live when you're great older. great place you know definitely want to live in West Michigan at some point again in my life but I don't have any friends really in Michigan that I mean I have a few really? but I don't really have like all my friends moved. All my friends are here. Oh, really? Are just drifted apart. Um, I always would like shit or dunk. Sorry if I can't cuss on here. You can do whatever. Okay. I would always shit on people who would leave to go to like LA or New York or here. I was like, why are you doing that? Like, you could just do that here, man. Excuse me. Get it out. Uh, edit, cut. Uh, <laughs> no, I would always... I would always just like be so anti moving. Yeah. And I think maybe it was because I was just, I was just so afraid of being left alone, like in Midland or like mm -hmm. in Michigan. And like that is like the root, that is like the root of everything for me. Not so much anymore because I like, I actually like learned this about myself and like, Eat therapy and I did some like EMDR mm. and I learned like it's crazy but I just like the thing of me being alone was so scary to me um and it would it like and I had such a bad attitude about Nashville and Los Angeles and and New York and every place that people would move to but I get it I get why I had the attitude and I still have sometimes have the attitude about like LA, yeah, um, that's but easy, to have. yeah. Um, but I just don't. But for here, like, I just wish I would have came here sooner. I feel like I've been here in like a year and a half, two years, coming down here since like for like three years, very consistently, and it's definitely changed my life. Like mm -hmm. meeting so many amazing people who are just so inspiring and so good at what they do. Like all my friends are so talented, and that pushes me to want to be way better i don't want to be a big fish in a little pond i just want to coexist with a bunch of with a bunch of average sized fish i think yeah, that's pretty and nice and a above average size yeah pond. yeah and i like and i just love that about it um living here and i used to think like oh i want to be like i want to people i'm just gonna go there and i'm gonna be like country guy or i'm gonna go there and do this thing and that thing or everyone's moving there because they want this it's just like no man something's happening and like as humans were attracted to like something that's happening and it's totally okay to like jump ship on your small town and go to the big town 
that being said, it's also totally cool to stay yeah. where you are, but like you have to have the expectations of like what are you gonna get out of it? Like Bruce Springsteen, literally on that in that Broadway thing, he says like he was upset with everybody like becoming these massive stars and why he wasn't getting the job. And he was like, that's because I lived in Freehold, New Jersey. Yeah. Nobody's from there. Nobody lives there. Uh, and that was like forever in the 70s or whatever, 60s. And he lived an hour away from New York City, but he like never knew anybody who went to New York City. Right. Like that was considered very far away yeah. back then. So it's just, it's interesting to, I just want to move here sooner. I, I think I would totally derailed the question, but I would No, no. Yeah. I, this is like a, worthwhile thing that I wanted to ask you about was like the idea of a band called Michigander living in Tennessee is interesting because it it must mean some things about your psychology because it must be like yes I'm living in Nashville and I see the value of moving here that's great mm -hmm. but I'm also still and I feel like I resonate with this because I stayed home for college and stuff I watched all my friends move away yeah I know exactly that feeling where I was totally. like we were all chilling in high school, having a great time. They all moved away for college, and I was there, and I was like, well, what am I? I went to the University of Scranton, so I was yeah. like just a weird commuter kid, and it was like, what am I going to do here by myself? And so I always kind of had this resentment towards moving away or whatever. And then I've, you get older, and you realize it's something that you got to do if you want to make things kind of happen or whatever. It's true. It's, it's kind of sucks, but it— But I wanted to true, bring yeah. Scranton with me kind of in a way. Like uh -huh. I wanted to bring my hometown with me. I want to bring my parents with my friends and everything. And so like this idea of being Michigander and like in Tennessee is kind of like a nice idea, I think, that you yeah. kind of like brought your – you are still that person. You're just in a different place. I don't know. Maybe, I mean, I'm, that was maybe kinda, I'm projecting. No, that's kind of like the whole thing with the title of – that's kind of the whole thing with like the whole – like name of the band, it was like well, well, Michigander is like what you call somebody from Michigan, and that's never gonna change. I will always be from Michigan. Right, might not always live in Michigan, but always be from there. Um, yeah, and so I think that was pretty. Excuse me, dude. This stuff's bubbly, isn't it? This stuff is bubbly. It's nice. It's very, it's, it's very good. Um, I always wanted to. Like represent where I'm from. Like I have like a Michigan tattoo on my arm, and like that. Um, it's like where I'll nothing will ever change about that. Yeah. Um, I'm very big on like honoring where you came from, and like honoring your past, but also at the same time, I'm very big on changing and evolving. So, yeah, it's a balance. Uh, but for these people that don't want to like skip college and just like pursue music on their own terms i really think that's the only way to really do it because you can't get in debt trying to do yeah. if you want to be a musician try i mean like give yourself a timeline i still give myself like if i don't have x amount of thing x amount of money in the bank by this date then i want to like figure out a way to either change everything or quit mm. i still do that stuff in my brain and in my journal yeah the hard, yeah. The hard part about that in my uh short failure of a music career that I realized was like putting a timeline on it is good for being accountable, but it's terrible for letting go and being inspired Big because time. yeah. Because I remember any time I would have an idea for a song that I even vaguely liked, I would have this horrible attachment to it because I was like, maybe this will be the thing mm -hmm. that'll make it work. And I found that to be kind of crippling because I always felt like I was up against the clock where I was like, if I don't make it by the time I'm 28, like it's it, it's over. And uh, it wasn't until that I like basically accepted, I was like, I'm just gonna focus on mastering.com and all these things I'm doing here in the podcast and that I started to write again because I yeah. did, had no pressure. And so do you feel like that's still present or do you feel like you have enough momentum and enough of a track record to be like, to let a little bit of that pressure come off you and say, I know I'm capable of doing it. I just got to keep doing it. Yeah. I feel, I also like really believe there's nothing else that I 
can do at this point. <laughs> like, this is it for me. Like, this has to work in one way or the other. Like, yeah, uh, I'm pretty deep in uh, the whole thing. So I need to make this work. It has to make it work. So now let me ask you this. Like, we, coming back to the first question I asked you, which was like, you've already succeeded by most people's measures yeah. of being an artist. And yet you still feel like you're at the beginning of your career. What do you want to be doing? Like, what what is the goal for Michigander? That's a great question that I don't know if I have a really good answer for. We could sit. We could wait. What do you think? I think that I want... I want to make, like, an album that I'm just super proud of. It's something I've wanted to do for... 15 years never done it I've never made an album mm. and so now I am making an album it's all been EPs and singles yeah and so like 10 plus years into this chasing a musical dream I'm like about to do the album which feels crazy and and then it'll be like well, what do I want after that like this album will be fully recorded in the next couple of months um and done ready like being mastered in, in like two months probably wow um and that's really exciting, but it's like, okay, then what? I just have like, like, I just want to be like, I just want to have a sustainable career. I have a career, but how I'm doing it is not sustainable. Boom. And I don't, and there is a point in your career based on the gifts that you have, the talents that you have, that you can't, you have to just roll with it. Like you have to like, for me, I don't know, let me, okay, for me, I don't know like the best, like I can't just do what I'm doing now is like open for somebody, headline, release a record, release music every year and hope it like works. Mm -hmm. I don't have like a big enough audience to like create some sort of like really sustainable, financially sustainable thing. Mm -hmm. Like, so that's where I'm at. I don't have that yet. Right. I couldn't like there are I want to be in the place where it's like, oh, if I want to take a year off, I can take a year right. off. Because okay. I, like that's would be great. I would love to be at a point where it's like when I go on tour, I know that we're going to sell a thousand tickets in 20 major markets around the country every year. That would be awesome. When I'm there. Cool. That would be great. Now, would I love to be selling 2000 tickets? Sure. Yeah. But you get to a point where it's like your streams catch up and your shows catch up. And the longer you do it, the more it just works. And that's what I'm really seeing is like I've just been so consistent with the gas on the pedal since day one of Michigander. I – okay, a couple things. It's That first, was not the greatest answer, but no, I'm this is good. about I, this all day. I'm going to ask you a couple questions on this because I think for a lot of people listening, it's, it's really valuable to kind of hear what it's really like to be a touring artist because there is still – I think it's less so now, but there is this sort of like stigma that like if you're opening up for the Lumineers, you're like a millionaire. Yeah. Like it's people funny. are like, you know, think you're getting like dropped off by the chauffeur here. I don't know. Can I tell you how much I got paid for that? Yeah. Please. I think I got paid $1,000. No. Yeah. 1000 bucks. Dang. It's crazy. What would you think? What would I think if I was like the stereotypical person? Yeah, like, person well, well, yeah, we'd be like, well, yeah, I think people th have this idea that it you're was one paid, show like, with the Lumineers, so I've got to play in front of five thousand people. People probably would guess that you're getting paid like twenty five grand. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen that much money from a show. Right. So the so the thing is, is now you're at the point where you can tour, you can make money, and by the time you're done decompressing from the tour, you've drained the bank account back down to zero. You got to get back out on the road for the most part. More or less. Yeah. And, and you're saying you would like to get to the point where you can take a break without yeah. taking it back down. And not like it. a break where I'm like not doing anything. Like yeah. I want to be writing songs and working on stuff. But it would be great to be at a place where I'd be like, I don't have to tour this year. Mm. And like that, see, that's where it also gets to a point where it's like that helps your touring business. If you're constantly touring oh, back yeah. to back one thing after another – and you're not taking like a quarter off or like a half a year off of touring. I feel like people aren't gonna show up to the show. Yeah, Grand Rapids is like, dude, we don't want to see out you of again, here, man. 
Grand Rapids would love a Michigander show right now. It's they've definitely been wildly neglected. Really? By me. And it's will change this year. But yeah. like it's just that but like Chicago. Like I'm not gonna come to Chicago twice a year, every year, forever. Yeah. And that's what it kinda has been. So when you talk about getting to the point where you grow your audience to the point where you can do yeah. something like that, what's the path for that? Is it like I I need to have one hit single on this album? Or I have a follow up question, but go ahead. Yeah, I I want to believe it's like having like a breakthrough song. I've had like songs do well. I've had songs stream pretty good, but I don't haven't had like a breakthrough song. I feel like everybody knows. Because that's the thing about listening to your albums is like you. And this ties into my other question. So sorry, I'm jumping. No, ahead, you're good. Your discography is like rock solid. Like uh-huh. every song, I agree. Thank you. Every song, <laughs> every song is like a good song. Hey. Um, and the interesting thing when I was like booking guests for the podcast is that you one one metric one may look at is like monthly streams on Spotify. Uh huh. And with TikTok nowadays, you see people who go from like literally five monthly streams to a million. Yeah. But then two months later. They're like back like, down to a thousand. Yeah. Whereas I feel like, and I could be wrong here, if you took off a long period of time, your monthly streams would stay pretty steady. They're pretty consistent. Because your fan yeah. base has grown with you over 10 years yeah. of seeing you tour as mm-hmm. opposed to two weeks, you had something that resonated with, they followed you, and then you put out your next song, they don't like it, and they go, yeah. why am I even following this guy? Yeah. And they unfollow you. Yeah. So it seems like where you're at now, you have a pretty solid like bedrock of fans. Uh And now it's just about getting that hit single, that lottery ticket that's going to kind of like get you to the point where. That is kind of true in a way. Like my my favorite band of all time is The National. Love The National. Love The National since like 2008 or seven or something like that. Forever I've loved The National. And it's weird to see them now playing like arenas mm-hmm. and like Aaron's like doing all this stuff with Taylor Swift and all this stuff. And like, that's so cool. But it's like, they're like in their fifties, mm-hmm. late forties. And they are, they're such a good band and they have taken so long to like build this fan base and they don't need like, they don't have like a, I don't think they've really had a hit single. Yeah. Like a number one. They might've had a number one. But like I don't think they they they're like careers riding on that. They're still kind of like uh, you can still kind of get some indie cred by yeah. being a national fan, even though they're huge. Like you know, Hippocampus, they're a great band. Yeah. They haven't. I don't think they've had like much radio success. Yeah, they have great streams, but I don't think they've had like a radio song. I don't think they've had like a mainstream breakthrough single. They're just really great. They're just a really great band who has like a very very solid discography, and they do what they think is interesting and what they like. And I think that is attractive to fans. So when you were recording the latest album, Uh did you feel yourself getting the urge to be like, I need that hit song? I feel that urge right now. You do? Yeah, because I thought I was done. I thought I had all the songs. And then I wrote this one a couple weeks ago. I went to a cabin alone in the woods. Oh, very bony. Bear yeah, very, I'm just trying. But I went. I was supposed to spend the night. Didn't spend the night. Just went out there for like ten hours. Babe, or something. I gotta get away. I was I like, gotta get away, I was like, babe. I just want to go write a song. I have like a couple ideas, and I was like, I just want to go. So I left home and I went to this getaway cabin thing. You've probably seen the Instagram ads for. <laughs> I think I have yeah. actually. And yeah. I was just out there, and I wrote a song that I think is just so so good. Mm. And I think it's like, it could be like that big single. And I just wrote it on a guitar and I went, oh my gosh, maybe I don't have the album. Mm. Cause I was like, okay, now I need to take something away. And it was like, I could take that one away. I could take that one away. I could take that one away and replace it. And I was like, oh, if I can take that many away, then those aren't good enough. So mm-hmm. now it's like, so like for the next two weeks before I go back in the studio to like kind of wrap things up, I'm just going to be writing with folks and trying to see if there's something I missed. And so that's where I'm at now because I would love to have a big single. That'd be awesome. But I also am like, 
don't want to sacrifice any artistic integrity or any vision right. that I have just to get that song. Because truthfully, I've tried to do that before. I've tried to do that twice in my career with two different songs. One song I hate. Yeah. That is out. I hate it so much. I thought like this was going to be like a big crossover. You got to tell me off air what song that is. Okay. Well, I'll tell you that one is called Tunnel. Okay. And people, I just think that song sucks. Um, It's a song of mine that I released thinking it was going to be a big yeah. smash. It was not. Um, it's embarrassing. Nothing's worse than when, uh, when you do sacrifice a little bit of your artistic like thing yeah. to do something that you think is gonna be a hit, and then that fails. Because then you're like, yeah, it's an especially type of. I did that a couple times where I like kind of like was making decisions to sort of optimize for like playlist ads. Yeah, and I was like, play the game. You know, I'll play the game. I'll, yeah. play, I'll do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, get on uh -huh. a couple playlists, and then I can do the song I really want to do. Uh -huh. And then that song, like, flopped horribly. And then I'm like, not only did I release something that I hate, but it also failed. And yeah. that sucks way it worse. It does suck. That honestly sucks way worse. And it's not like and it happened another time, and it's not like it's the worst song I have. And I, it's a fine song. But I thought this song was going to really pop off, and it didn't. And then, like, other ones... Yeah, on the same EP, like really took off some one organically, and one we pushed, but it was just it's interesting. Well, I'll tell you, um, I've heard a lot of like I said, I used to listen to a ton of artist interviews, and I've always heard that people oftentimes. I think Ed Sheeran did this with uh, Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, the album was finished. Mm -hmm. I think they had picked the single, and then that song appeared out of the ether. And and I'm pretty sure, if I had to guess. The idea that you thought the album was done probably takes the pressure off enough to where you go out yeah. and probably write something uh -huh. and you go, oh shit, yeah, this so, is freaking good. So that's what I'm. That's where I'm at right now with it. Well, that's an exciting point to be at. It's, but I have like two more weeks to finish up the record, and hopefully, it's done. Wow. Yeah. What's that going to be about? Well, I guess not the whole album. Yeah. Um. Can I look at my phone for a second? Yeah, yeah. Someone asked me what this was about. Oh, and you wrote something like that. And I wrote something kind of funny. Uh, about your someone music. said to me, scrolling. Oh, yeah. Someone said, what do you think some themes are for the new, um, <laughs> the new record? And I wrote, critical of idiots, <laughs> slightly political. Mostly personal. Critical of idiots. That was a text I sent to a close friend. But um, he, uh, but yes, that's what I kind of think that record's about. And it's it's just going to be just like a self-titled debut album. Oh, cool. It's Michigander. Dang. The self-titled. That's, that's, that's got to be a dream. Yeah, it's cool. It also puts a lot of pressure on like not having to come up with a, a title. Yeah. Because that's, I just, this is just an... I graduated high school. I graduated college, and this is the career now. Ten years in, releasing a self-titled um, yeah it's album cool. is like a pretty baller move. It's fun. Yeah. Uh. Okay. How are we doing on time? I'm not taking up too mm. much of your time, right? I don't know. I haven't looked. What time is it? Two eighteen. Okay, we're good, good right? Yeah. Um. I have a sneaky suspicion that you were listening to the Bruce Springsteen show because you have a slate of shows coming up that are not. So dissimilar to what Bruce did uh -huh. on Broadway coming up. Um, and I wanted to talk about that because I thought it was really interesting. So I'll tee it up for you. And then obviously you cool. correct me where I'm wrong and everything. Yeah. But you were out touring a lot last year. 158 sh shows. Wow. 158 days gone on the road. Yeah. Dang. You were touring a lot. And now the only thing that you have on the cal calendar, right? Uh, besides Bonnaroo. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Have you All heard right. of it? That's a new subtle thing. flex. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the only thing that you have on the calendar now is these two intimate, three, three yeah. intimate shows with Jason, not Michigander, right? It's like Just Jason my name, Singer. Jason Singer from Michigander, yeah, where you're playing like an acoustic set mm -hmm. and telling some stories, right? Yeah, it's called Songs and Some Talking. Oh, how indie of you. It's very indie. That very is hip. very indie. I wear a jean jacket today, so I could tell you about it. Um, Do you have a like a beanie on? And you're I don't have like... a beanie. I'm not, I will sweat too much for a beanie. Yeah, okay. Um, no, yeah, I'm doing these three shows. Uh, and 
I did watch the Bruce Springsteen document or Broadway thing recently as I'm freaking preparing. In, yeah. I'm freaking in your head, bro. You got it. I'm uh, in as your I'm head. preparing for these shows. Um, my most show will not be as good as his oh. because he can talk and play at the same time. TBD. While it's pretty good. TBD. It is TBD. Um, but we're playing uh, Davenport, Iowa, which Sick. is like the home of uh, Daytron. I don't know if you ever heard of that thing. Mm-hmm. It was like this. The guy, it was like this thing where bands would come through and record three songs, mm. and they put them on the subscription thing, like in the early two thousand. Oh, cool! So like Mumford and Sons came through, and Local Natives and Lumineers, and all these huge bands would come through when they were tiny. They would record with this guy named Sean in Davenport, Iowa. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Dav- uh, I think Day Trotter is now dead, but Sean still lives, and Sean is this m- amazing Sean Moeller in Davenport. I was this amazing mystic human being who wow. lives in Iowa who books shows at the Raccoon Motel. And he brings in crazy bands and small bands like myself. And we've always had a great time in Iowa playing in Davenport. It's like one of my favorite places to play. And um, so we're going to play a show there. That's cool. Or I'm going to play a show there, just myself. How many people in that room? Uh, it's like 200. That's cool. Uh, uh, we've sold it out a few times with the band, but we're just going to come back solo. And then we're going... To a, like a hundred cap room in Indianapolis, that would be cool. I think that one is sold out. And then uh, I'm, pl- I'm playing a small one here in Nashville at the Analog Hotel, Hutton Hotel. Nice Analog at the Hutton Hotel, something like that. Um, so I'm playing these three shows, and it's just starting to kind of put out a feeler and get a vibe for something that is different than a full band rock show. Mm. I think I would love to. I think I would love to just do some of those um, types of shows and kind of build that thing. Because, like, I would love for when my band, the full band show, is selling out, like, thousand cap clubs, I would love to play these smaller rooms by myself every other year or so Mm. and just feel how that goes, just to have, like, a different, like, like one, it will just be very fun to just travel with me and a friend who I'll have open. My friend Dylan Grantham, his band's Young Ritual. He's opening these shows, and so just me, him, and a merch guy going out. Yeah, that's cool. And it'll be so fun. And so we're just gonna do those, and hopefully do more of them in the future. Was this your idea? Yeah, it was. I wanted to. I just think it'll be good to have like some like from a business perspective, that because I think that's what a lot of people care about listening to this is uh there's no overhead it's just like me and a guitar and a yeah, keyboard and you can take that anywhere one hotel room and it's just in a car or and you, you could probably i would imagine i mean i don't really know but i i can imagine where you're at in your career you can go to a lot of cities and probably sell out a yeah it's some um, yeah you would 100%. think more but uh yeah we'll see are yeah. you nervous those? I'm all. I'm not nervous about this week because this week is just damn important. In Indianapolis, easy peasy. People are stoked to be there. Always nervous, horribly nervous, always to play Nashville. Why? Uh, because one, uh, you think it's not selling well, and then like the couple of days before, people buy tickets. So that's like, but still like nerve wracking. And then the whole crowd is musicians and artists, and you're like, I'm so exposed on these yeah. for these shows. There's like no band. It's just me and a guitar so, trying to tell stories and play songs about the stories. Okay, because I came from the business world, like I said, and I started playing music. And whenever I would play music, I always felt like a fraud because I was like a business guy. And I was like, everybody's going to know it. They're going to smell it on me. I wasn't like a lifelong musician. Like I didn't start writing music until I was like 18 or whatever. Like I didn't play instruments until I was 18. And so I just always had this feeling that I was like, didn't belong there but you who's been doing this for freaking 10 years mm-hmm. getting up in front of like the nashville people seems like the most natural thing in the world so what is it that you're worried about what is it that you're afraid that they're gonna like see or is it just general nerves it's just nerve i don't know i just get nerve. like is my tone good enough yeah is my guitar in tune enough does the mix sound good enough? Yeah, like, there's going to be like some. It's guy. all that kind of stuff. It's like, is there enough people here? Yeah. Like, is it sold out? Is there like, what special guests can I get to show up mm. to the show? Uh, Like, I always feel that pressure. Mm. Like, 
I feel like you have to have special guests when you play here. Like when it's a hometown show, it's like who can I get to come out? And so uh that's always like a thing too, is like yeah. I wanna make that show extra special. So people like it helps legitimize what you're doing. So, so you're gonna tell us some stories like in between songs and yeah, stuff? Yeah, I have like an all planned out, I've been rehearsing really? it. So really? it's like not word for word, but like vibe by vibe. I have um I have been planning it. So you were going through the set with like your wife? I haven't no, I haven't showed anybody yet. My managers really? want me to do a live stream of it. Uh to like, for them. Oh, for yeah. A live stream. Like I they want me to perform for them. I'm horribly nervous about that, to be honest. Yeah, that sounds brutal. Yeah. A live stream, like, on Zoom? Yeah. Oh. Just because they want to see what I got. <laughs> that would make I feel me the, nervous. I feel the same way. Yeah. See, I told you guys. Yeah, no, that would scare the crap. I think that would scare me more than the real shows. Yeah, and it would, I, I don't know why. Well, They're not going to, like, be stopping me and giving me notes. They will probably give me notes after. Do you play your music for your wife? Uh, Not really. Sometimes. I'll be like after when I record it. I never like, hey, can I show you a song? Yeah. I just like I feel I feel weird about that. But I when I record a song, I'm I always <laughs> like, here you go. We had to have a very serious conversation the other day because I sent her a song and she said, Sounds great, love it. And I said, Did you listen to it with headphones on or mm-hmm. from your phone? And then she's like, Ugh. Yeah, it's like uh I was like, That's not how you do it. You gotta put the headphones on and Yeah, it's like, hey, can you take a listen to this track? Uh it's not mixed yet, by the way. Mm-hmm. And the drums, uh I'm yep. still comping the drums yep. and the but can you just give me a listen? But actually, actually, you know what? Forget it. Yeah. Don't listen to it at all. Uh-huh. That's usually how my process is. But I made yeah. the mistake of um, I wrote a song for my wife recently, and I was, like, trying to conquer some demons of, like, getting over, like, playing it. And I was like, let me show it to you. And I started playing it for her. And I was about, like, 10 seconds in, and I was like, I've made a horrible mistake here because I, I am so nervous. Yeah. That was the most nerve wracking thing because they know you for who you really are. So when you right. start saying like poetic things, they're kind of like, uh-huh. it's, it's touching, it's sweet, but it's also, that's how like, I feel about, I feel that way about my wife, but I also feel the exact same the way about my managers. I can, I love them so much. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it would be just like very Weird. hard for me to play these songs on a live stream. On a to live them. stream. Yeah. And I told them I don't want to do it, but I'm like, I will do it. I ordered a good webcam. Aren't they here in Nashville? No, they live in Colorado. Dude, record it here or something. We'll hook it up. There we go. We'll yeah, get we'll yeah. get a good audio set up. Yeah. You can give I want the audio to actually be really bad so they can't I can, yeah. so I can blame it on the audio. You could cut in and out a bit. Yeah. No, but I'm really excited for the shows. I think they'll be really cool. And I think it'll be cool to I think it'll be cool to do them later on too. An event like um like when I'm a more established artist, it'll yeah. be cool to be able to go out and just play myself did you like the idea of um because you're going to be able to provide context to those songs that people normally wouldn't yeah i think that'll be kind of interesting i hope people like that i've always like loved like um we toured with manchester orchestra right uh and andy goes out and does solo shows and it was just cool to just chat watch him like he played the ryman and they came back and played basement east and it was cool to see that show Mm because like i got to watch their show every night for like six weeks Mm. And then just seeing Andy play the songs and talk a little bit about them. It's cool. Yeah, yeah that is exciting. Um, hmm. I have so many questions to ask you, but I'm trying to think of where I want to go next. Isn't it crazy how much that bubbles? Yeah. Like you can hear it. Oh, I think that's the TV crackling. Oh, okay, dang. <laughs> Like, yeah, dang, no, I'm man. fairly fairly certain that this TV will explode at some it point. It will. Yeah, it'll burn down. Um, yeah, because when I when I turn it on, it sounds like a nuclear bomb, like at firing you up. Hear, you don't have any smells though, right? When you turn Not it, yet. Okay. No. Um, but our audio guy has to like notch out this really annoying frequency that comes from the TV. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it looks freaking dope. It does look cool. And that's all that I care yeah. about. Um, okay, so you've got the the acoustic set coming up. Are you planning on? So the the record is going to be finished Mm -hmm. do you know when the record's coming out this year probably end of summer really yeah and then is it like tour for a while uh maybe we're see like this is another thing is like how can i make touring alone sustainable because like we did a lot of touring last year and it was fine because it was like split up but then we realized like we went to end our year last year. We left a little bit before Halloween and then came back home. 
a few days before Christmas. So that's like that's like seven weeks on the road. That's too long. Like I can't do that again. Don't want to ever do that again. Why not? It's just way too long to be away from home, and you are. You. <laughs> Uh, it's bubbly man it sneaks up on you it does it's just way too long to be away from home seven weeks is a long time it's almost two months of being on the road and like we're not in the position where it's like our families can come visit us yeah we're in a van it's like it doesn't make sense like it would cost too much yeah like for extra hotels and like it's like doesn't work so that's like honestly really hard to be gone that long so like i'm trying to like plan our so like for the tour we have slated for later this year, that's uh, also not announced yet. But ao ao uh, <laughs> two exclusives. It's like probably eight weeks long in its total, but we're sp- or maybe seven, but we're splitting it up by like a week in the middle oh, of cool. being home. So I was like, we'll go out for four, come home for a week, go out for two and a half, mm. three. Uh, and that we was looking at that, it makes it so much less daunting. You're yeah. like, oh, I'll be home for a week in the middle. And then I can just pick back up and wrap it up. And then I'm home a week before Thanksgiving. Oh, that's nice. Like we spent Thanksgiving on the road, like in oh. New Jersey. At like what a, a place to spend And I hop in like a hotel parking lot that kind of thing. Like so that's where we were. It was depressing, but it was funny. And um, so that's kind of where we want to make, like those little changes will make touring more sustainable. Mm. Yeah. And if it pops off, are you prepared to like go Hard. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, we're. I think we'll probably go to Europe again. Really? Oh, I didn't what? know you did. Yeah, Europe. we went to Europe last year. What was too. that like? Crazy. Really? Like it was like starting all over again. Like we played this very very small shows, like to like fifty people, forty people, like in Berlin or whatever. Yeah, Berlin. That must have been cool. I mean, it is cool because they're there to see us. Yeah. Like, they are there to see Michigander, and you're like, I am so far away. I'm on the other side of the world, and there are, like, 50 people in the room to come see my show. That's nuts. And, like, that happened, like, in London. And and they were, like, fan fans? They're fan fans. They really? were into it. Yeah. That it was must, cool. That must be such a hard thing to process. I, I rem- Okay. I played two shows in my entire life, right? Okay. First one was like basically like it was at Arlene's Grocery in New York City. Yeah, um, uh-huh. and it was like, you know, there were a couple of people there, but it was mostly mostly like my friend, your friends, friends, yeah, friend like, rock. Yeah, exactly. But there was one dude, Marlon. Shout out Marlon. Uh, followed me like from the first day I released my first song. He was there, sang every single song. Amazing. In the front, like stood there, looked in my eyes, Best and sang feeling. every single song, and I was like. I was like, I don't ever have to do this again because at least I had it once. I yeah. that was my cold play moment with Glastonbury was Marlon standing up front row singing the words all my songs. Isn't that awesome? If you're in Germany, it's crazy. That must have been surreal. The cool part about like that is like we have had done nothing over there. Yeah. There's not been any streaming push, there's been no radio push, there's been no press push. It was just one hundred percent organic. Like we played and like, and then we played like Paris. And there was like uh, a b- ton of people there, and then we played in the UK, but like Manchester and Southampton, and then London. It was so cool. How? I mean, that must just be the, your reputation. Like again, this is what we talked about before of you having this reputation as like a live band. Yeah, that must open these doors for you because I can. I feel like there are a lot of artists in the US that wouldn't be able to do that, that you would think would, but to be able to play shows in Europe. It's is, crazy. Yeah, it's gotta I mean, be a big undertaking. It is crazy. It's very expensive. You don't make any money. Luckily, like our yeah, label you know, at the time. By boat? We flew oh. to a boat. No, <laughs> like, like we flew, We and then we came, it was like, here's the weirdest part. We were just, we played Europe first time overseas. We fly back to Washington, D.C., and then we have a day off to like recoup and get our head straight. Yeah. And then the next day, we played a, a festival called Ocean's Calling mm. in Maryland on the ocean mm. to thousands and thousands of people. So that is like, it's so strange because like two days ago, we're in London playing for 100 people tops. Yeah. And the next 
two days later, we're in back in America playing for like maybe eight thousand people, five thousand people, or something crazy. That is crazy. All so right, it's, messes with your mind in a way. Yeah, I can't imagine. It must be hard to process. Um, I want to do this. Um, I want to. I'm going to have you back on the podcast at some point down the road after the record comes out. Uh So where do you think you're going to be the next (laughs) next time we get to have you? If, if should we do it like a year from now? Yeah. Let's say, let's say like a year ish. Okay. So you and I, we crack open our made pops. We sit back in the chair and I go, Jason, I'm going to drink this same one. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to burp into the mic. I'm going to be burping the whole time. Yeah. And we're going to say, I'm going to take my glasses off. I'm going to be like, Jason, what a freaking year. Man. What a year. What a year, dude. Hey, we have a lot of shaking on this. Fe- uh, January of next year, mm-hmm. January 2025. What will be the headline? I Jason don't know. Singer. Scary. Again, their headlines. Something. What? Put it out into the ether, dude. dude I don't want, I don't want to no, say. Just put it out. There. Should we just say where we're at right now? No. I want you to put it out into the ether so when we come back a year from now and you've exceeded that, you could shoot shoot realistic. You could go big. Give me some. I want to have – I'll have completed a headline tour. Okay. I want to sell out 90% of the shows. 90%. That would be great. And they're big rooms. They're bigger rooms than I've ever played. For the new record. For the new record. And we're going to sit here and we're going to – We're going to go, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, we're going to both laugh. Okay, that's what would be cool. I would love – well, what else would I want to do? I'll do one with you. I'll say the. I'll say. Yeah. The, what do you want to ha- do? The podcast is not even launched yet. By the time you come back in a year. Ooh, this is. We gotta do this every year then. Yeah, yeah. Every January. Every January, I'll have a check in. I love this idea. Imagine like, You'll my be- career tanks though, and yours takes off, or vice versa. No, nah, and then you're like, I don't want to talk to that guy again. <laughs> yeah. Scandals are Scan- all there's broken ton- out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of stuff coming out. I would say a year from now, I would like to have fifty thousand f- followers on the podcast. That's a good goal. But I, th- I, I would also like to have fifty thousand follow followers on Instagram a year from now. Okay, where are you at now? Uh, twenty something, twenty six, twenty five. That's I mean, so I want to double my following in a year. Okay, I'll double my. I'm at seventy seven followers because the podcast is not launched. Oh, yet, so I okay. can double that easily. You can double that. All right, fifty thousand for me, personally. Okay. Headline tour, ninety percent of the shows sold out. Uh huh. If we succeed, we'll sit here and laugh. If we fail, we'll talk about how that's okay. Yeah, we'll figure out what went wrong. We'll really dissect it. Okay. We'll really dissect the failures and we'll see exactly what we could have done to have made a uh a different Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna like leak its song title. Oh yes. I have a song called Giving Up that oh. I think is just a big old smash. Is that the new one that you wrote? Uh it's a new one. In yeah, I wrote that in the cabin in the woods it's called Giving Up. And if that song pops off, yeah. That would be cool. Okay. I'm hoping People check a year from now. That song will have twenty million streams. Twenty million streams. That's a lot of streams, for me. I don't have any songs that are twenty million. Really? I don't think so. I think Misery is probably close, but I don't think it's there. Twenty million. Let's say ten. Ten million. I hate to do. Also, too, let me be very clear because I'm sure there's going to be like a couple people that listen to this that get all whiny and go, "It's not about the numbers, man." It's and not like, about the it's numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's just a fun thing. To but do. it is. But it's also kind of like a nice way to check in. Yeah. So like, it's you like, see that Billie Eilish thing every year she gets yeah. Vanity Fair, I think, interviews her. That's what this is. That's what this is. And the nice thing is, is like the it's like your Lollapalooza set where you're vamping and you get the chance to check in and say, where am I now compared to where I was playing this song yes. X amount of years ago? We'll get to sit down. We'll go, hey, look at all the freaking bread. Should we say like who, like they always ask her who the most famous person is that follows her? Uh, Who? So like oh, every year I can say like yes. who's the most famous person that follows me right now? Yeah. And then next year we'll see if I can get a more famous person that follows okay, me. Okay, cool. Who is the most famous person that follows you? Let me see. Noah Khan. Easy. He follows you? Yeah, he follows me. What? But he's followed me for a long time. Now he's famous. But that's even better. Yeah, that's true. So Noah is probably the most famous person that follows me. 
Yeah, he's got to be, right? Maybe we'll have him on, too. Yeah, Just hang out, yeah. chop it up, the three yeah, of us, the boys. No, bring Noah in. Get the boys together again. It's ca- so I have to get someone more famous than Noah Khan. That's going to be tough. A year from now. He's quite large. He's very famous now. It's so weird. You're going to have to get like... And um, great. I lo- I, no, no offense. I love his music. Oh, my gosh, yeah. But uh, it's crazy. He's just blown up. Yeah. So I need to top that one. Oh, you know who followed me? Who? Who might be more famous? Who? Maybe not. Jelly Roll. Oh. Jelly Roll's pretty famous, right? Yeah. I think Jelly Roll has more followers than Noah Khan. A little special guest at the uh, Jason Singer show, maybe? (laughs) That would be cool. I don't really know any of his music. I just know he follows me. Yeah. Probably because I'm like a big guy and I do music. And I live in Nashville. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's my bro. That's a bit of me. Yeah. Uh, you could for get you. Jelly Roll in here. Yeah. Well, um, I sent them an email. Did you actually? Yeah. Nothing back yet. Still waiting. Okay. Well, the hard part about this podcast is before you release the episodes, it's no very hard um, because you just sound like a dude who's saying, hey, we're starting a podcast. Yeah. They don't they don't really know that there's like a, a whole sort of business arm behind us that yeah. like is making this like you a have thing. something legitimizing i love doing podcasts honestly i could do one of these every yeah. every day hey i have to go to the radio station right after this for an hour really ra- i'm gonna be on air well you'll have told all your stories by the way. i know i will just have to sit there quietly <laughs> yeah i'm all tied hey buddy yeah i'm, I'm, I'm all talked out i'm good thanks <laughs> all right well a year from now good luck with the, the record thank you dude can I hear the song that you recorded My after we're out? Yeah, absolutely. That's so nice. I always listen to podcasts, and they always get, like, the off-air exclusives, yeah, and gonna, I would get so jealous. What's the, wasn't I supposed to tell you something else off-air? Um, oh, yes, it was. I can't remember what it was. can't remember. Okay. Well, we'll have a little conversation yeah. once it's done. Thanks for coming on, though. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being so candid and everything uh, in, in all the information you're giving. I think you are... Truly such a great figure. When you said Michigander represents the indie artist, the DIY artist, dude, like you embody that. Thank and you. it shows in your music. It shows in your discography. It shows in uh, just listening to everything that you have put out and having it be just such a solid body of work. And to put on your music at any given point in your career and have it feel like you're walking into a festival and you've got that Love little that. pre-show buzz going on is like a great gift that you've given the world. Thanks, and, man. Uh, I wish you all the luck. And Thank we'll you. check in in a week.